so glad to you that you have joined us this evening. So really appreciate so many of you joining us tonight for this webinar, Moving Forward on Climate Without Washington. We have well over 1,500 uh, folks tonight joining on the webinar. Vermonters, many of them gathering in town offices and living rooms across the state energy committees and student groups gathering together. I know um, some of you are also tuning in from outside of Vermont. I'm so glad you can join us though. My name is Johanna Miller and I lead the Energy and Climate Program right here at the Vermont Natural Resources Council where this webinar is taking place. Um, <clears throat> we're in the lovely city of Montpelier, the state capital. And I'm going to quickly walk through this evening's agenda um, <clears throat> and go over a couple of logistics and then turn it over to our slate of speakers for this evening, including our headliner, Vermont's own climate, economic, and social justice champion, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. So just a quick note that Senator Sanders will likely join us just a bit later than he had intended um, as the vote on the nomination of Jeff, Jeff Sessions for Attorney General is taking place, um, started at 6.50 actually, um, so clearly a very good reason for the Senator to be a little late. So We'll loop the senator in as soon as he is available. Um, I also have the <clears throat> honor of being joined by Vermont State Senator Christopher Bray this evening. Uh, senator Bray is chairman of the House Natural Resources and Energy Committee, which has jurisdiction over climate and clean energy and energy. Um, also joined by James Haslam, the director of Rights and Democracy, and Paul Burns, the director of the Mont Vermont Public Interest Research Group. First, I want to thank and recognize all of the Vermont organizations co-hosting this webinar with us, including VPIRG, the Vermont Conservation Voters, Rights and Democracy, Renewable Energy Vermont, Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, Vermont Energy Education Program, the Vermont Chapter of the Sierra Club, the Vermont <coughs> uh, Energy and Climate Action Network, or VCAN, Vital Communities, the New England Grassroots Environment Fund, Vermont Interfaith Power and Light, the National Wildlife Federation, Audubon Vermont, Conservation Law Foundation, Toxics Action Center, and 350 Vermont. We've had a lot of partners this evening and a lot of organizations and Vermonters concerned about and interested in the state of Vermont and this nation doing something serious about climate change. Unfortunately, not everyone from these important mission-driven organizations can speak this evening, which gets us to the logistics. On the heels of this webinar, we'll send a follow-up email to everyone who registered. That will include a link to the video recording of the webinar, as well as a short overview of each of the organizations co-hosting tonight, which will include contact information if you want to get involved in any of their important work. Our plan is to keep this webinar to just over an hour. Limited times we <clears throat> means that we will have limited time for questions as well. Um, but we do hope to field uh, a few questions at the end of the presentations. You'll see a chat box um, on the side of your screen pop up when some of the presenters are speaking. You'll have the ability at that time to submit questions or to offer ideas. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. In the unlikely event that we can't, though, please do follow up with any of us um, or any of the webinar hosts with your questions or thoughts. Again, one of the reasons we want to send the follow-up information about all of the hosts. So look for that. The catalyst for this webinar was to ground us in the sobering new reality of a federal administration, one that disdains science and promises to roll back our international commitments to climate action, as well as fails to see the significant economic opportunity in transforming our fossil fuel-powered society to a cleaner, greener, more just energy system. This webinar is aimed at focusing us on the opportunities and the obligations to act at the local and state level, more so now than ever. You'll hear about some of the specific efforts underway and ideas for strategic opportunities to engage. <clears throat> With that, I wanted to welcome Paul Burns, the director of VPIRG, um, since we haven't yet been joined by Senator Sanders, to sort of frame out a little bit more about what we're going to be talking about tonight and why it matters. So, Paul Burns. Hey, thanks, Joey. 
Um, thanks to all of you for, uh, for joining us as well. We really um, appreciate you being here, and it's um, it's fun uh, to be to be on the phone with uh, so many of uh, of our fellow Vermonters who care so much about these issues. Um, I want to just kind of note what what everybody on the phone uh, understands right now, which is that these are challenging times. These about women's rights or civil rights, uh, ethics, democracy, science, truth, a livable planet. You know, it's dark days, and we get that. We understand that that is true. But this is no time for despair. You know, while we won't see a lot of good policy coming out of Washington, D.C. anytime soon, we are regularly seeing acts of courage and leadership there. You know, just in the last 24 hours, we saw Senator uh, for reading a letter from Coretta Scott King. That had to do with the nomination of Jeff Sessions for Attorney General that, that Joey referenced, and that vote is taking place now. But when Elizabeth Warren was censured, she simply left the Senate chamber, went outside and read the letter um, uh, on Facebook Live. I mean, that's kind of demonstrating courage and creativity. Um, also last night, we had our own Bernie Sanders on CNN uh, debating Senator Ted Cruz on health care and whether or not all Americans deserve to have health care in this country. Um, you can bet Bernie is working every single day and basically every single evening for us as well. And we want to kind of give him more to work with, I guess. And that's part of why we're here tonight. We're convinced that it will be up to the states uh, to demonstrate real leadership when it comes to protecting our environment, um, uh, standing up for public health, and creating a clean energy future for all of us. We must count on the states to act, and if we're thinking about the states, we must also recognize that Vermont is a leader. I mean, if there is to be resistance, and if there is to be real progress in this country in the next few years, and I think that there will be, and we're committed to that, then we must recognize there is only a small handful of states who are in a position to really lead, and Vermont is one of those. We're in a pivotal place in history right now, and the people across the country, in states that really don't have an opportunity to demonstrate leadership in these areas, they're looking to places like Vermont, the small handful of places that can really imagine making progress. People are counting on us to act, and we have a responsibility to do so. In part because we have that chance, that opportunity to lead, we think we can and we will do so. I know for me, I've got a five-year-old at home, and I, I have to act. I mean, I feel like nothing's going to stop me from doing everything I can to make progress, to make this a livable planet, and certainly to address the, the worst ravages of climate change. And so tonight, what we want to do is share with you some of the ways that we think that you can be evolve, involved in the most effective way to make positive change. To us, it kind of boils down to opportunity, responsibility, and community. And those are some of the themes that we'll be talking more about. When we think about opportunity, um, we uh, will be speaking more about a, a wonderful piece of legislation that's sponsored by Senator Chris Bray, and you'll be hearing more about that in just a few minutes. As many of you know, Vermont has a comprehensive energy plan in place, and it calls for us to get 90% of our energy from renewable uh, sources by the year 2050. Is that ambitious? Yes. Is it doable? Yes. And is it necessary? Absolutely. That's what science tells us. And this is one of those times where it's, um, uh, it's our responsibility, I guess, to stand up for science. We know that clean energy, clean renewable energy works for Vermont. Um, we have about 17,000 uh, jobs right now in the clean energy sector uh, in this state. Every dollar that we spend on clean energy and energy efficiency here means that that's one less dollar that we have to send out of state to fossil fuel companies to line the pockets of ExxonMobil and others. There's no better champion of renewable wind and solar energy than Bernie Sanders. That's real leadership that he continues to demonstrate on a daily basis. And his arguments in favor of renewable energy will be strengthened if he can point to real success stories uh, back home here in Vermont. And so that's part of what we want to give him, is that opportunity to show success. You can join that effort. Um, right now by helping us to transition off of fossil fuels to demonstrate your support for renewable energy for that 90% by 2050 goal that we have um, right now as part of the comprehensive energy plan and hopefully in the near term as legislation in this state. 
Um, I think that there will be on the screen shortly uh, an opportunity for you to actually sign on and demonstrate your support for that 90 percent by 2050 uh, goal. You see there now, um, you know, beautiful image of Vermont, um, and and what you see there too is what we might now refer to as the new working landscape in Vermont, where we see renewable energy as part of that working landscape, and that working landscape has evolved over many generations here, and now it really is more and more including renewable energy like that. So uh, again, you'll be hearing more about the 90% by 2050. I want to move to the second area of, the, of our conversation, um, where we talk about uh, a responsibility to act. And that responsibility is not just once a year. I mean, all of the organizations who are co-sponsoring this, I'm sure, appreciate your annual gift of support. And maybe at one time sending in 25 or 30 or 50 or 100 dollars to a group once a year was enough it is not enough anymore we want to have you as engaged as you can possibly be um, in, this, in these days moving forward and we've seen engagement from vermonters in these past few uh, days and weeks uh, like we haven't seen before at least not in many many years uh, i've been a part of rallies and, and demonstrations and events in vermont like that were so inspiring and motivating and i'm sure many of you have as well um, and we frankly need more of it. So we're calling on all of you uh, on the phone today to commit to taking at least one action per week. Um, and again, you'll see a, a slide that talks about or reminds us of all the co-sponsoring organizations here. Um, and when we talk about that, you know, we're talking about enlisting, resisting, and persisting. Uh, so we're First, I want to encourage you to enlist, to get on the membership list of any one or hopefully all of the organizations who are co-sponsoring the call here tonight. Many of those organizations will have regular opportunities for you to engage in political action or events that are taking place in, uh, in and around your communities or in this state. So sign up. They're great organizations. They deserve your, uh, your support and your engagement. Resist. What we mean by that, you know, go to rallies that may be taking place. If you're not into that, or if you want to do something in addition to that, write a letter to the editor expressing your support for clean energy, for action on climate. Um, there will be rallies coming up. You'll hear more about those. But contact your legislators once a week. I know it sounds like a lot, but they'll get to know you and know you well. And you'll be asking them, what have they done this week on climate? What have they done this week to advance clean energy? Uh, all your reps and senators, they deserve to know who you are and they deserve to hear from you. And frankly, if we had a thousand people on this call, 1,500 people on this call, uh, reaching out to their legislators every single week on these issues, it would be a monumental uh, effort and it would be, it would demonstrate real progress and I can guarantee you we'd see action in the legislature this year. That's what we need. And then persist. I would say the legislative session runs now through uh, early May probably. Um, we need that action every week during that time, but you know, we've got to be in this for the long haul. Um, and uh, that's the way, frankly, folks on the other side have, have thought about this for not just a year or two years, but 10 or 20 years. I'm not saying it's going to take 10 or 20 years for us to make the progress that we need to, but we need to plan to be in this for more than just a few weeks um, and, or even a few months. Be part of this change. Be part of this effort to move things forward. Um, and that's where we're going to see real progress. And now uh, I am told that we have Senator Bernie Sanders with us. Okay. Um, Paul and uh, Johanna and Brian and everybody else, uh, thank you very much for coming together this evening. Uh, and as Paul just indicated, uh, I just cast my vote in terms of the nomination of Jeff Sessions to be Attorney General, and uh, to nobody's surprise, I think I voted very strongly against him. I think he is exactly uh, the person that we do not need uh, to be the Attorney General of the United States. Um, and I want to begin by telling you what I think all of you know, uh, that these are going to be very, very challenging times. Nothing is going to be easy, uh, but our job is in every way that we can to be creative in fighting back to protect the environment uh, in the fight for social justice economic justice and racial justice that's where we are now just before i came down here i was 
uh, looking at a newspaper article which talked out that out in uh, Seattle, Seattle, Washington, the city council there went uh, on record as ceasing its relationship with Wells Fargo uh, because of Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo's investment in the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, and these are the kind of creative ways that we need to go forward in every way that we can uh, to protect the environment and to protect the other values that uh, most of us in Vermont share. So tonight, though, I just want to thank uh, Joanna Miller of VCAN. I want to thank Brian Shoup of VNRC and Paul Burns from VPERG and everybody else uh, who has come together uh, this evening. And I, my understanding is that we have over a thousand people who have RSVP'd. Uh, and this is speaks to the way that people in Vermont feel about uh, the environment. So I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. And uh, I don't have to uh, tell anybody on the uh, phone that these are very uncertain and unpredictable times and that our country and our planet face enormous challenges. And it breaks my heart, it breaks my heart that we have a president of the United States now who does not understand the issue, who does not care about the issue, uh, and that we're just going to have to work around them. And that's what our job is in Vermont. It's what our job is in 49 other states in this country. Uh, I think many of you know that I believe, as many of you do, that the great environmental crisis uh, facing uh, our state, our nation, and the world is global climate change. Uh, for 200 years, uh, we have been burning increasing amounts of fossil fuels to heat our buildings, to generate electricity, and to power our vehicles. And when we burn fossil fuels, we release significant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In fact, today, humans release more than 35 billion tons, 35 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere every year. Uh, according to NASA, the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide has never exceeded 300 parts per million in the past 600 and 50,000 years. In 2013, CO2 levels reached 400 parts per million for the very first time. And by the way, these are facts, not opinions. Uh, what is absurd is that scientists have been warning us about the heat trapping impact of CO2 for a very long time. And I just recently learned that as far back as 1917, 100 years ago, Alexander Graham Bell warned that, and I quote, the unchecked burning of fossil fuels would have a sort of greenhouse effect, end of quote. 100 years ago, Alexander Graham Bell. So it should not come as a surprise uh, to anyone, maybe except to Mr. Trump, to hear that the planet is warming at an alarming rate. Uh, 2016 <clears throat> was the hottest year on record, and 16 of the 17 hottest years have occurred since 2000. Nor should it come as a surprise that we are already seeing devastating effects of climate change all across the United States and around the globe. More intense wildfires, heat waves, drought, extreme storms, flooding, rising sea levels, and more. In a world not dominated by big money interests, the debate would be over. The vast majority of scientists have told us not only that climate change is real, but that it is caused by human activity. And those scientists say that if we have any hope of avoiding the worst impacts of climate change, we must aggressively transform our energy system away from fossil fuels and toward energy efficiency and sustainable energy. However, and this really is quite unbelievable and quite sad, we now have a major political party, a party which happens to control the White House, the U.S. Senate, and the U.S. House, and a majority, a significant majority of governors chairs around this country. We have a major political party whose policy is to ignore science, ignore science. We have a president that calls climate change a hoax, 
created in China. And we have a nominee to lead the EPA who is a climate change denier. And make no mistake about it, um, Scott Pruitt's job as EPA administrator is not to enforce environmental laws. It's not to protect the environment. It is to dismember the EPA and make it as ineffective as possible. That is what his function will be. And it goes without saying uh, that I will be voting against this disastrous uh, nominee. Uh, if confirmed, uh, Mr. Pruitt will be the proverbial fox in the hen house, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency and a man who could care less about protecting the environment. Uh, President Trump has also nominated climate deniers to lead the Department of Energy and the Department of Interior, uh, who have vowed to expand fossil fuel extraction on public lands. And Republicans in Congress are working overtime right now, as we speak, to roll back important environmental regulations like the Clean Power Act. Uh, they are clearly more interested in protecting the profits of the fossil fuel industry than making certain that our grandchildren inherit a planet that is healthy and that is habitable. Uh, my Republican colleagues are ignoring the warnings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that says that unless we drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, temperatures will continue to rise by as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit over the next century, which is just an unbelievable increase in the temperature of the Earth. Furthermore, they are ignoring or simply do not care that the effects of climate change will fall especially hard upon the most vulnerable people in our country and throughout the world. Now, I do not mean to be painting a helpless picture of a dystopic future. But Pope Francis was absolutely right when he said, and I quote, the world is on a suicidal course with regard to climate change, end quote. All right, so that is the bad news, and it is bad. But despite these challenges, we do not have the option of throwing up our hands in despair. Because when we do that, when we turn our backs on this struggle, what we are doing is turning our backs on our children and our grandchildren. And I have seven beautiful grandchildren and on future generations and on the future of this very planet. So giving up uh, and living in despair is not an option. Our option is to be smart, to be effective and to fight as hard as we can because the stakes are almost unimaginable. It is the future of the planet. By participating in this very call this evening or in the Women's March in Montpelier two weeks ago, and I've never seen, I was there and I just never ever saw uh, that many people uh, at a demonstration in Vermont. They actually closed down the interstate because there was no parking available in Montpelier. It was extraordinary. Uh, or the spontaneous protest against Trump's immigration orders uh, I think what Mr. Trump is seeing that the people in Vermont and people all across this country are ready to stand up and fight back. While the challenge of addressing climate change is huge, there is no question in my mind that we can meet it head on. I will continue to fight for bold solutions here in Washington. I think that's what the people of Vermont want, and that's what I intend to do. And I, I say that as a member of both the Environmental uh, sub, uh, Committee uh, and the Energy Committee. And that means that we will oppose climate change deniers who have been nominated by President Trump. It means that we will fight to end corporate welfare for usually profitable fossil fuel companies. It means that we will fight to invest in energy efficiency and renewable energy and help workers transition to the clean energy economy. It means investing in clean transportation and high-speed rail of the future. Just this morning, uh, I, I was at a hearing uh, on uh, planning for infrastructure legislation. 
uh, and that will come in my committee, uh, the, uh, the Energy and Public Works Committee. And we are going to do our very best to make sure that when we talk about rebuilding the infrastructure, we will place a very high premium in combating climate change in ways to do that. It means making our grid a lot more capable, our electric grid a lot more capable of dealing with solar uh, and wind. It means investing in rail so we can get trucks uh, off of the road. Uh, and it means investing uh, in um, uh, many other ways that we make our country more energy efficient and our energy system more sustainable. Uh, but much of the progress that will be made over the next four years will not be here in Washington, I fear, but it will be done at the state and local levels. And I commend all of you for doing just that uh, in our beautiful state. Uh, some of you serve on one of the state's more than 100 town energy committees, and I love those committees, I really do, uh, because they are bringing people at the grassroots level together to work in their own towns, to make their towns more energy efficient and sustainable. And that's just an extraordinary development. And I know that many of you are now are working with your neighbors to button up their homes, to make them more energy efficient, to install heat pumps, and to advocate for local energy projects. Uh, my vision is and has always been that despite the fact that we are one of the smallest states in the country, we can be a model and example for the whole rest of the United States. Uh, some of you uh, advocate and work at the State House uh, on energy policies to help Vermont meet its goal of achieving 90% renewable energy by the year 2050. And I congratulate you for your efforts and you're working with the legislature and the governor. Some of you run small businesses or work in nonprofit organizations that help Vermonters save money through energy efficiency measures or by deploying distributed solar or wind. Some of you educate young Vermonters, uh, teaching them about the incontrovertible science of climate change. So I've had the pleasure of being at um, uh, conferences with young people throughout the state uh, organized by the university, uh, which were great. And I, it, it is just extraordinary to see these bright young people who take uh, environmental issues so seriously. Uh, and I think uh, in our state, we should just be very proud of the many young people who are being actively involved in environmental issues. Uh, also, many of you are taking action at the individual level, whether you are organizing in your communities, calling your legislators, installing rooftop solar, or driving uh, energy efficient cars. And make no mistake about it, we are making a difference in Vermont. We have more than 218 megawatts of permitted or installed uh, solar capacity. And that includes everything from rooftop solar to community solar to 4.7 megawatt, to a 4.7 megawatt project in Williston that can power 1,100 homes. That's pretty good. 90,000 Vermonters participated in energy efficiency programs in 2015 alone. And the electricity needed to power Vermont has been reduced by almost 15% because of our efficiency efforts over the years. That's just extraordinary. 30% of Vermont's K through 12 students attend schools heated with sustainable, sustainably harvested biomass. Montpelier's new biomass district heat plant is heating dozens of state, municipal, and private buildings in our capital city. The Washington Electric Co-op not only has a 100% renewable energy portfolio, but it meets more than half of its members' electric needs by capturing waste methane from the Coventry landfill, another just innovative project. And while I know the topic is somewhat controversial, we are meeting more of our energy needs by harnessing wind energy, something that I very strongly believe in. These are impressive achievements but as you know, we must do more. And I have no doubt that Vermonters are up to the challenge. If you haven't already, please consider joining one or more of the groups hosting this call. Uh, advocate for clean energy policies in the state legislature. And don't forget to start close to home. Help your local town energy committee 
transition your town to a clean energy future. And let me congratulate Montpelier's Town Energy Committee for being recognized by VCAN last month for its excellent work over the years. But let me conclude by saying that I know that many people are dispirited by what is going on in Washington. But we do not have a choice. Uh, we are where we are, and our only option for our lives, for our generation, for our kids and our grandchildren is to stand up and to fight back as creatively and as effectively as we can. And what I will tell you is especially in this age where anything that happens today is transmitted all over the country, all over the world, that what we do in Vermont, the examples that we set, the innovations that we develop, they will spread. They will spread like wildfire. So what we're doing is not only of vital importance to the country, it becomes a model for the nation. And that is why events like this are so terribly important, uh, to bring people together, to organize, and to press for a clean energy future. Uh, thank you all very, very much for your efforts. And please know that I stand with you in the fight for environmental justice, for economic justice, for social justice, for racial justice. So let's stand up, let's fight back, and as Vermonters, let's help lead this, this nation in a very different direction. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you. Wow. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for all that you do for joining us tonight and for outlining for us the reasons, the urgency, and the opportunity of responding to climate change and the new reality that, we, that we're facing. So on the heels of a national leader, Senator Bernie Sanders, it's my pleasure to introduce to you a state leader on climate action in Vermont. Uh, Senator Christopher Bray, as we told you before, is the chair of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. He's been a tireless champion of taking action on climate change, understanding the response to it, um, if the policy is shaped right, which is his arena of expertise, um, can also grow jobs, our economy, save people money. Um, it's a win-win situation if Christopher Bray is helping to drive it. It's our pleasure to have Senator Christopher Bray here with us this evening, laying out sort of the landscape, um, giving us a little bit of a historical reflection and more importantly, a look forward on policy solutions as we commit to moving forward on transitioning off of fossil fuels in a way that supports our economy and does our part to tackle climate change. And with that, in our office here, in the cozy little office in Montpelier, I warmly welcome Senator Christopher Bray. Hi, good evening. Um, again, my name is Chris Bray, and I have the honor and pleasure of serving, uh, leading the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee uh, here in Montpelier. Um, it's a pleasure, too, to be following uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, who does such great work for all of us in, in Washington. And, you know, it's always sobering to listen to uh, someone in D.C. talk about the realities of uh, the, the current situation there. It, you know, I mean, it, there is a certain dire side to hearing that someone who uh, is being promoted to dismantle the EPA is being moved forward. Um, I want to uh, thank our local hosts. So uh, there are many of them, but I'll just say the point person is here is uh, Joey Miller at uh, VNRC. And thanks, too, for everyone who's taken some time out this evening to get involved, get on the webinar, and uh, and then I hope to follow up with actions after this. So I want to start with the good news. Vermonters have reaffirmed in poll after poll that they want a clean energy future. Um, it's good for our economy. As uh, Paul noted, you know, we see over 17,000 jobs in the clean energy economy in Vermont, and it's the fastest growing sector of our economy. Uh, these are local jobs, which means that we're taking energy dollars that have generally flowed out of state and instead, we're supporting the work of neighbors and Vermont businesses as we create, distribute, and move energy around within the state rather than importing it. For example, you know, we send about a billion dollars out of Vermont each year buying in transportation fuels. 
uh, how much more positive it would be if we could help Vermonters the, uh, transition to electric vehicles and use the equivalent of 80 to 80 cents to a dollar a gallon uh, electric fuel as the way of moving their vehicles around. It's uh, the work we've been doing is good for our electric rates. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, Vermont was the highest in New England. Now we're the second lowest, and I'd say we have the most stable rates. So businesses thrive on stable rates, and they also are looking for lower rates. So our work in energy has not come at the cost of um, the economy, but instead it's actually grown the economy. Uh, and it's also last, but maybe most important, uh, that it's good for the environment. As we reduce demand for fossil fuels, for transportation, for heating, for cooling, uh, and generating electricity, we deliver a environmental benefit. Um, and I would say on that last bit that we have moral obligation. You know, we are stewards of this planet for a brief time. While And while we are responsible, I think we owe it to uh, each other to our children and to future generations to take care of the planet we've inherited and do our very best to pass it on if, uh, in better condition than we found it. Um, the status quo we have come to appreciate increasingly in the last decade will not do. And by the status quo, I mean gathering up materials from around the planet every day and burning them. Um, what, and the cost of that is that we have uh, and a and recent MIT study shows that 200,000 Americans die early deaths each year because of breathing in the uh, products of burning all those fossil fuels. So it's an essential transition for the environment. It's an essential transition for human health. And um, uh, happily in Vermont, we've embraced the challenge and we're making good progress. So I'd like to switch gears uh, to talk about practical things. You know. Um, what can you do to help yourself, to help your community, to help the region you live in, and to help the state overall? Um, so the, the first thing I would say is I think everyone's familiar with uh, energy efficiency work in homes. If you are buying electricity in the state of Vermont, you're also contributing to efficiency utilities. Uh, it's in general around the state, that's efficiency Vermont. But if you live in Burlington, it's Burlington Electric that supplies. Either way, you're already contributing to the funds for doing energy efficiency work. I would encourage people to contact your local utility, your energy efficiency utility, that be Burlington Electric or Efficiency Vermont, or if you're using natural gas, uh, Vermont Gas Systems has a similar program and obligation both to deliver energy services to their customers. So call them up, get an energy audit, develop a plan of action, and start taking steps. You may hear that the total program proposed is 7,000, 10,000, 12. Whatever the number, it may seem too big to do. Many of these people will deliver programs to you that you can uh, buy off in affordable chunks and do step-by-step -step improvements on your home. We've been doing it in my home, and I can tell you it is, we're using far less fuel, and it's far more comfortable. Um, the second step at a higher level is to join your town energy committee. Senator Sanders mentioned it, and throughout the state, we are very fortunate to have uh, town energy committees. Uh, they are organized under VCAN, and you can see the, uh, the web address, uh, so www.vcan.net. Get on the um, site and look for a local town energy committee, because you will find motivated, uh, inspiring, and uh, people who know a lot about the energy opportunities uh, in your town in in the region you're in, and they can help uh, educate you, and you can help educate them if you're an expert out there that's already involved in this work. Going one step higher, uh, regional. So as you may know, last year the legislature passed a uh, planning law that says at the regional level, we're going to look at how we can move towards 90% renewable by 2050. Um, every region has regional planning commissions, and we need informed, motivated members to join those regional planning commissions to help shape those large-scale plans that are going to help 
town energy committees do their work at the town level. And then finally, at the highest level, the state level, um, the legislature uh, needs to be held accountable and it can use your support both. So for instance, this year we have a bill, S51, in which Vermont commits in writing to generating 90% of its energy using renewable energy by 2050. This is a goal we heard Governor Shumlin articulate and support, and we've heard Governor Scott articulate and support the very same goal. But um, we need to be entirely clear and intentional, and that begins by naming and statute the goal that we want to steer by. Again, 90% renewable by 2050. Now, 2050 is 33 years ahead of us. We have a massive transfer, a transformation in the way we generate and use energy to, to undertake. Uh, but I'm entirely confident, based on the great results we've seen in the last 20 years, that Vermonters can come together and make this change using you know, smart, steady progress toward the clean energy future that we want, that we need, all by growing a, uh, a stronger and cleaner economy. So please get engaged, stay engaged. Um, it's, as everyone has been saying tonight, the a time for thinking about doing these things has passed. We really need all of us to step up and be part of developing a solution. So I thank you for your time tonight um, and look forward to listening to the rest of the presenters this evening. Have a good evening. Thank you, Senator Bray, and thank all of you again. So that was really important federal context. Um, state context and a call to action at the local, um, well, first of all, at the individual level, at the local level, at the regional level, and at the state level. So thank you to Senator Bray. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a lot, um, we're throwing a lot at you, um, but it is my pleasure now to introduce the next speaker, James Haslam who is the founding director of Rights and Democracy, which is a grassroots organization that works in both Vermont and New Hampshire on a broad range of economic, uh, social, and environmental justice issues. Um, it's my pleasure to have um, James Haslam join us this evening and the Rights and Democracy team partner up because the long and the short of it is Um, and they're really focusing in on building the kind of political and, and social revolution that's going to be required and breaking down the barriers to actually move progress so forward. So with that, I really want to welcome James Haslam, the Director of Rights and Democracy. Hey there. I hope everyone can hear me. This is a, a fun uh, new technology uh, for, uh, for many of us, and this is a uh, it's been great here to be, and um, I just want to uh, thank uh, Joey and VNRC and VPIRG. Rights and Democracy is absolutely thrilled uh, to be working with all, all the partners building a movement for climate action. I'm a dad too, uh, and the threat to the future of having a livable planet uh, for future generations is a fight that I'm all in with all of you. So, you know, uh, here in Vermont, like Bernie said, you know, we absolutely have to lead an example for this country. Uh, Rights and Democracy believes it is critical to connect the movement for climate action in the broader fight to protect the environment to struggles for economic justice and social justice. And now more than ever, you know, we believe that we have to break out of the issue silos and connect and build across movements. We must connect the movement to confront global warming and protecting the environment to the movement for black lives and for racial justice and the movements right now uh, that are organizing to attack uh, workers' rights, attacking our healthcare system, public education, uh, immigrant rights, uh, attacks on the LGBT community, on uh, Muslim refugees, people with disabilities, you know, the threats to social security and, and seniors uh, rights to retire with dignity. All of these same forces of greed, uh, you know, this, the, we see these, you know, the same kind of things that are exploiting people are the same forces that are exploiting the planet. 
and driving up global warming and threatening uh, people across our community. So, you know, we've seen it, you know, it's been a shock uh, to have all of these things be threatened uh, with this new administration and with the radical Republicans in, in Congress. Uh, but um, it's been interesting to have an organization that, you know, started a year and a half ago, as Joey said, uh, called Rights and Democracy at this moment. Uh, but, you know, we started because in many ways, you know, there's great efforts by organizations on specific issues. And we saw the need to put organizing capacity to join these struggles together, to build together uh, and, and, and build across movements. We wanted to be able to do this in one way uh, by creating a candidate pipeline for people from our communities, you know, from these struggles, from our movements, who could run for office up and down the ticket. You know, we love Bernie Sanders. And, you know, everyone in Vermont loves Bernie Sanders. But the fact is, is we need hundreds of Bernie Sanders. We need thousands of Bernie Sanders, and they need to be running at every level. So, you know, we are excited uh, to join the webinar because, uh, you know, we believe that if we're ever going to stand up to the fossil fuel industry, to the Trumps of the world, and to everyone else, uh, you know, exploiting our communities, that we have to build a kind of unity that we haven't seen yet. And, and you know, we think we can do it uh, here in Vermont. Uh, we're excited to, to strengthen the efforts of the, of the movement, as Senator Bray was talking about, for 90% uh, renewable energy in the, by 2050 and the massive transition that that's going to take. Uh, and, and that, for those reasons, we think the participation in the local town energy committees and an expansion of energy democracy is going to be critical. But one thing in particular uh, that, that we wanted to do tonight is invite everyone in this webinar to join Rights and Democracy and many groups, dozens and dozens of groups that are going to be organizing another mass rally on April 29th. Uh, on that day, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be going down to D.C. For another People's Climate March, it'll be hundreds, thousands of Vermonters going down, and we're going to hold another massive sister march here in Montpelier to show that the Women's March was just the beginning. So uh, the, there's a Facebook page you can RSVP to, and you can let us know there if you can volunteer uh, and help organize it. And, uh, and I'm just going to conclude by reminding us that climate change was heading in an unsustainable direction before the election. The people in power now have begun to push us down an even more dangerous and darker path, but I'm absolutely certain that the unity and solidarity that is building at this moment will be able to turn this around and put us on a whole new path that puts people and the planet over profit. Uh, so I thank all of you for tuning in to this, and we're really excited to work with all of you. We need all of us to win. Thanks so much. Questions. We're snuggled up here in the VNRC office, and thank you again for all your patience with the technology. We have people far afield, but right now we have this team here at VNRC. Look at us. Here we are. Hello. And we're going to field a few questions, but I really just wanted to um, sort of follow up with um, sort of an overview of what we think is um, best next steps to continue moving forward on climate. First and foremost, immediate action. We've talked a lot about it tonight um, in terms of what we can do now. Um, support the 90 by 2050 Comprehensive Energy Plan goal um, and the S51 bill that Senator Bray is moving forward in the Senate. It's, it's a goal. It affirms a direction. It, it ties up um, and underscores what we already have in statute right now. And it really is an economic opportunity and a moral obligation. So immediate action, weekly action, again, um, it's really important to stay in tune, engaged. We have many important co-hosts of this event that are doing work both at the state policy level all the way down to the project level, working with VCAN and vital communities to start an energy committee, expand your energy committee, do what you can at the local level. If it's not an energy committee, if it's a 350 Vermont node, if it's the planning commission, the goal is to engage and list Stay connected with these organizations and others that really resonate with you, but continue to ensure that this is an issue of paramount importance and persist, and that's the really important part um, as well. And then, again, the long-term action, the grassroots engagement, we've all underscored it. 
this evening, but engage, 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 and really deepen your engagement at the local level. It's absolutely fundamentally essential. So we've gotten lots of questions, and I have um, from attendees, and Paul has them in his hands and wanted to just run through some of the themes of the questions that have been raised this evening, and we will wrap up in about 10 minutes uh, around 8 o'clock to respect your time, but Paul. Thanks, Joey. Um, we've had a number of questions about uh, putting a price on carbon. Where does that fit into the mix here? How does that uh, fit into our overall strategy for addressing the problem of global warming? And as many folks on this call know, that uh, a lot of the organizations who are co-sponsoring this webinar um, have been out there working for a price on carbon as part of a broader tax reform effort. I mean, really putting a price on carbon is, is just part of tax reform. Our current tax structure doesn't work very well for a lot of people. It taxes the things that are basically good for us and good for our state. Whether we're talking about um, putting a, a price on your wages or your pay or products that you buy or your property, there are a lot of taxes that people would like to see reduced and could be reduced if we were raising some money by taxing a thing that there is no tax on now, which is pollution, air pollution that comes from burning fossil fuels. Um, I note that just in the last 24 hours, a group of Republicans, former high-ranking Republicans with the uh, Bush administration, Reagan administration, uh, James Baker, Hank Paulson, um, these are not um, uh, liberal uh, lefty activist types, but really quite uh, conservative um, uh, officials from Republican administrations who embraced and put forward uh, this idea of putting a price on carbon at about $40 a ton at the federal level. There are lots of good reasons for this. It is good for our economy. It is obviously good for our planet. It creates jobs. It cuts taxes that we would prefer not to see. All of those are perfectly good reasons. Unfortunately, their plan was focused on getting Congress and the White House to act. And as we've talked about already, um, we don't think that there's a great potential for um, leadership like that to be coming from Congress anytime soon. So we at the state level, um, with colleagues in states near and far, do believe that the leadership on that effort is going to come from the states. And again, I would say that we're going to look at that as a, um, uh, approaching that issue as a part of a broader tax reform. What taxes are we looking to cut here um, and what, uh, how could we use the revenue raised through taxing the pollution that comes from burning fossil fuels? Um, so that is a conversation that's happening in the state house. You're going to hear more about that over the course of this legislative session. So I appreciate you know, the many questions that we received on that, but that's um, you know, that is definitely an idea that we need to move forward on. Uh, and again, we're not doing that alone as a single state. We're going to do that in conjunction with a number of neighboring states and, and states across the country. So we have uh, some other questions um, here. And here's one that perhaps Senator Bray would like to address. Uh, there's a question about the, the climate caucus in the legislature, what kind of role that plays um, in the process of, you know, decisions that are made in the legislature. Sure. So uh, Climate Caucus meets on Thursdays in uh, room 10, generally in the State House, and it's a chance to come in and learn from uh, leaders and uh, people inside and out of, from government on um, what uh, is going on on climate issues, uh, energy issues, steps that are being taken, programs that are being developed, and uh, so it's, you know, of course, like everything else in the State House, always free and open to the public. It meets noon on Thursdays. It'll meet every Thursday probably from right now to adjournment. And then you can uh, follow up with, I think the caucus has roughly 50 members. So you can follow up with any, uh, may well be that your local legislators on it, or um, anyway, contact any of those folks and we happen to share materials. We're also not sure if it's up yet. We want to create a climate caucus webpage because we often see good presentations and we decided we want to provide a mechanism. So whether you can be there or not, you'll be able to uh, engage in what we're all learning together in that caucus uh, by getting on the website. So uh, I'll share information with Joey about that. And I'm sure if you come back to the VNRC site, there'll be a link probably within a week that will get you to the climate caucus information. Thank you, Senator Bray. And just to follow up on that, I think I may have some of the latest news, but it sounds like there's um, now 55 members of the Vermont Climate Caucus, which um, I'm not sure, but it, it strikes me that it may rival some of the, our other 
seats across the nation in terms of uh, the depth of leadership um, across both bodies, the House and the Senate, the Climate Caucus is a very important partner. Related to another question, what are the prospects of working with Governor Scott on climate change? It's clear that clean energy is a job creator to, for the state. Do you think you'd want to build on that success? And I have not had a personal conversation with Governor Scott, but all indications are that absolutely he wants to build on that success. One of the first, if not his first press conference um, as in his term as governor was standing up with the over 60 employees of Sun Common at the Hunger Mountain Co-op celebrating Sun Common's new solar canopy and celebrating the jobs created by clean energy. As you might be aware, the clean energy sector in the state of Vermont is one of the fastest growing sectors in our economy. We have one out of every 17 Vermonters that are doing something in their jobs relating to helping people reduce their energy, transition to more uh, renewable um, sources for heating, um, for transportation, and for electricity. It's very exciting. And, and the senator, or excuse me, the governor has also come out supporting the 90 by 2050 renewable, 90 by 2050 renewable energy goal. So it's extremely promising. The legislation that Senator Bray has introduced, all indications are that this is a broadly supported um, a piece of legislation and and Governor Scott and his team, we very much look forward to working with him and the opportunity abounds to turn that goal into economic opportunity and a response to climate. In terms of other questions, I don't think we have much time for more because we are very cognizant of <clears throat> being considerate of people's time, but we did accrue a list of questions and some comments from some some comments from folks. So I just wanted to underscore that we will follow up with a live wink, wink. <laughs> we'll follow up with a live wink to this webinar, um, a live link to the webinar. We will also follow up with a list of the hosting organizations, and I'll include, if it's okay with you, Senator Bray's contact information. And our hope is we can try to answer some of your questions um, via, you know, any of the contact information that we share or we encourage you, as we've noted several times tonight, to be in touch with any of the hosting organizations on this webinar. The long and the short of it um, is that we were extremely lucky to have uh, Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Christopher Bray join us this evening. And we are grateful for, for the hundreds or over a thousand of you who joined us this evening because you care so deeply about doing something about climate. So this is just the beginning um, of the new conversation in the state of Vermont and at the national level about what it means to respond to climate. Um, but we really look forward to continuing to work with you and deepening our engagement and to follow on Senator Bray's um, suggestions to really encouraging you to, to get as involved as possible at so many different levels. There's no, no time to sit back and wait. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you again to all the hosting organizations Thank you to all of you. Um, thank you to folks like the Green Energy Times who helped promote us and help tell the story about why our commitment to clean energy and climate matters. Um, we have so many partners. We need so many more. Please go out, reach out, engage people, stay in touch with us. And in the meantime, get ready, put your loved ones to bed, read a good book, and think about um, all we can continue to do together. Um, but thank you so much again. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you.